Good afternoon. I am extremely excited to be here. Um, we are not going to talk a lot about legal today, though, which most people are used to when you see me speak. We go deep in intellectual property. We talk about contracts. And I find that, and I'm more than happy to answer those questions, because those are typically the questions I get, despite whatever it is I'm talking about on the stage. Um, I want to talk about negotiation, because this is a really common thing I see in my practice that people struggle with, because I'm pretty sure nobody here likes to negotiate. Do I have anybody in the room who actually like, gets psyched to negotiate? Yeah, it's like pins are dropping. <laughs> So I think if we reframe how we look at negotiation and we get a good framework, which I'm going to give you the six steps that I use in every single negotiation that I do, I think you're going to feel a lot better about approaching negotiation. Because negotiation really means you have somebody, something, somebody else has something, and you sort of want to figure out a way to do it together. And so if you look at it that way, if you look at it as something mutual, something that's going to benefit everybody, and you reframe negotiation, we're not thinking about it like when you go buy a car, right? Because how many people think when you think negotiation, you go in there, you're like ready to go, and somebody has one number, and then somebody has another number, and then we just sort of meet in the middle. That is not negotiation. That is like a tenth of the steps. And if done correctly, you never even have to have those conversations. So we're going to reframe and look at negotiation. But the first thing that you want to think about and you have to look at is what kind of negotiation do I want to be in? Um, there are three types. There's the competitive negotiation, which is the one I just described. It's the car dealership, right? I want to get the best possible deal, and I want to pay the least amount of money for something and get the most things. And the car dealership wants to give you the least amount of things for the most amount of money. That's a win-lose. No one feels good there, right? You leave, you're just like a little, feel a little dirty and like upset and mad. Um, that's, a, that's not a good way. And so competitive, we're not going to talk about those types of negotiations. So there's two other types. There's cooperative negotiations and collaborative negotiations. Cooperative negotiations are slightly different because you're really trying hard to meet a goal at the end that you both share. So you sort of know where the end result is going to be in getting there, and that's frequently not what we're doing. So for example, franchises are a good example of that. You all know what the end result is going to be there, but you just have a couple things you need to deal with to get to the end. And while those can feel nice, most people don't face a cooperative negotiation. So what people are really facing are collaborative negotiations. And so when you start to look at what a collaborative negotiation means, that means that you're going to be gathering a lot of information. You're going to be working with the person that you're negotiating with versus working against them so that you guys can come up with a mutually beneficial result. So how do we use the collaborative approach? And this is a little bit of the mentality that you need to have going in. So your attitude. This is the most important thing. Particularly as a woman, I frequently walk into negotiations and people think I'm younger than I am, I'm less experienced than I am, and they think they can take advantage of me. And they also think that because I'm really nice. I lead every single negotiation with kindness. I do not get aggressive. I don't get angry. You get mad at me, I'm just going to get nicer, which is going to make you angrier. <laughs> And it works. It's very disarming um, to a lot of people, particularly in my field, because I'm frequently negotiating with other lawyers. And so I did get a very good joke, which I have to give credit to, my friend Hillary. When you talk about your best lawyer that you know, like that bar's really low. Like nobody likes lawyers. And so there's a reason for that, because lawyers can be really aggressive, and they can be really difficult, and they can latch on to positions that are unnecessary. You don't need to fight over that. They want to fight over everything. And so I don't conduct myself that way. I don't let that happen. And so the minute that attitude starts, where you lead with positivity, you lead with the assumption that we're all going to win. You're not focusing anymore on your individual achievements. And that's incredibly important. You want to focus on maintaining the relationship. And I don't want you to think this means you're going to get walked all over, because you're not because there is a big difference between kindness and standing up for yourself. I will never be walked over, but I'm always going to do it with the most kind attitude you can imagine. The disagreements and the important thing to frame yourself as is they are about issues. They are not about us personally. They just aren't. And I'm going to give an example of how a negotiation went really bad for somebody that I was working with. 
So I had a client, I'm gonna talk about this negotiation because it's actually a very recent one that I was engaged in. It went very long and it, it tested me. And so I had a client who was in the unfortunate situation that they posted a copyright protected photo. Everybody's greatest fear, right? You fear that cease and desist, that letter that has five figures on it asking you for automatic statutory damages. So this client had done that. There was no malice, there was no bad intent, there was none of that, but this client had taken a professional photographer's photo, had tagged the photographer, had said, go look at this photographer, they're amazing, we love them, and the photographer sent a cease and desist and asked for a lot of money. So the client comes to me and says, what do I do about this? And so we, we, I asked a bunch of questions, we had a bunch, and I said, let me just reach out to the lawyer, see what I can do. So I reached out very amicably and I said, hey look, you know, I know the law, you don't have to school me on the law, I know what's going on, but let's be realistic about what actually happened here and let's try if we can be fair to your client, but we can also be fair to my client. He, <laughs> if I could tell you and put up on the board what that lawyer wrote to me, <sighs> I had to take a minute. It was rude and inappropriate and ridiculous and so I had a minute where I was like, well, now it's on. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I took that step back, um, but what I realized was he could have gotten so much more from me if he just would have led with something different. But not even that, he was held on to the position because as I found out later in my conversations with him, this attorney was also a hobby photographer. And he had taken on his client's own issues, because let's face it, photographers get ripped off. Everybody here has probably had a photo lifted, and it sucks, and it's not right. But when you make it personal, it clouded his judgment and he was unable to have a good negotiation with me because he was personally taking on his client's issues. And I get that and I said that to him. I said, listen, I have content creators as clients all the time, but it's not personal. And so you have to take personal out of it or otherwise you're never going to be, have a good negotiation. And it's really important from the very outset to know your goals and we're gonna talk a little more about that knowledge. So I'm going to go into my steps and we're going to talk a lot about research and knowledge, but it's really important when you're setting your goals, when you're thinking about what you're looking to do and what you're getting to out of this deal, you want to focus on why you want it. Don't latch on to a position. I must make $5,000. Because the minute you latch on to a position, you sort of lose the why. What am I doing for this? What are the reasons that I'm doing it? Because that takes into account, that stops taking into account a lot of the underlying issues to the negotiation, and it doesn't give you flexibility. You always have to be flexible in a negotiation. Because honestly, everything is negotiable. It's not just the dollars. And we're gonna talk about that. You wanna have a variety of options. There's loads of different ways that you can win at the end of a deal. And like I said, you have to keep it objective. It has to be fair. So I'm gonna talk about negotiation in six stages. The first stage, you have to strategize. You have not spoken to a single person yet. So I want to really bear this in mind. A lot of people think the negotiation starts where you just tell somebody what you want, they tell you what they want, and that's the negotiation. That's step five, that's literally the bargaining. We're gonna do so much more ahead of time so that step five is really, really short. So you gotta set your goals and you have to set them high. I mean really high. There is no limit to what you should be setting. You may not get it and that's okay, you have to be all right with that, but too often I have people say, well, I hear it because I'll talk to clients. A client will come to me with a contract and say, hey, can you help me? I call it ghost negotiation, so I ghost negotiate for clients all the time. I'm ghostwriting emails for them that they can send to their contacts because when you bring in a lawyer, people get a little weird. And so sometimes though, I negotiate all the time and so I will literally ghostwrite emails for clients but I get on the phone with them and I'm like, okay, what do you want? What are you looking for? And the client will say, well, I want 2,000 but um, I'm just gonna say 1,000 and I'm like, stop. Now we're gonna ask for 3,000 because you have do. You have to aim high and it isn't because you're negotiating against yourself or anything like that because you have to get used to the fact that this is what you're worth. Um, and so you have to aim high with those goals. The next thing that you need to do in your strategy, and I'm talking this should be a piece here, I'm a, I write, I handwrite everything out which is crazy but 
I do. And so this has, should be like a page in your notebook when you're sitting down for a deal and you're gonna strategize that deal. So what's your walk away position? Where will you walk away? If you do not have a walk away position, you have no negotiation. You must be able to say no. So if you can't say no to a deal, you're done from the get go. So you have to know what that is. But not only do you have to know what your walk away position is, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and an example of that, but you have to also know what your BATNA is, and that is your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And there are so many. I have clients come to me and they ask me and they wanna have a conversation about me performing services for them, and I give them my prices, which are not negotiable. And so they say, <laughs> sometimes you can't negotiate. And so they say, I'm not, I'm not ready for that right now. And I'm like, that's great, I totally get it. Like, that's fine, you know, come back to me. And I probably will provide you with a little bit of information because I wanna give something. I want someone to know the value of what it is that um, the services that I provide. And I will tell you the best alternative for me is someone who feels good about that interaction they had with me, even though the deal didn't close, they didn't hire me for whatever reasons they are. Um, and they may refer me to somebody else. Or in six months, they may save up and come back to me. So those are your best alternatives to a negotiated agreement. So knowing what those is will help you in your negotiations, because no matter what, you always have a goal at the end. Walk away positions. So I am sure, as we are all, many of us are service professionals, right? And you have the clients who are always like, but I just need one more thing, right? I always need just one more email or one more something. So I recently had a client who was a very zealous father, and he had a daughter who is underage, and she recently had some viral success on YouTube, as people have been known to have, and so I'm sure you all know if anybody has had that, what happens to your inbox? And when you're 15, you're like, what are all these things that people are throwing at me? So he came to me and he said, I'd really, I'd like to hire you and work with you because I do have an expertise in the influencer space. Can we talk a little bit about how you may help us because this is all new to us? I said, sure. So I, I offer, as part of my services, a complimentary consultation. So we did that. He then came back to me and said, hey, I want to schedule another call with you. He actually went on my schedule, set a time, and I said, oh, huh, that's not open. Um, I was like, you, you know, if, you're go if we're going to have another call, which I'm more than happy to have, you have to hire me because at this point, you know, it's time to pay for my services. He goes, I think it would be in your best interest if we had a second call because this is going to be a really big deal. <laughs> so I took another breath and I just wrote him back very clearly. This was my walkway position. I don't do that. And that's that. That's my boundary. And so that was it. And I was willing to walk away from it because I know that if I start to allow my time to be taken advantage of in that way, I'm never going to have a business and I'm never going to be able to you know, pay my employees, to be honest with you. <laughs> so you have to know what that walkway position is and what your BATNA is. And you have to think about, like, how am I going to open the conversation? What am I going to do? How am I going to start this conversation? And what do I think the other side is going to want to talk about? And what do I think are interesting to them? And the next thing, the column that you're going to want to make is something called currencies. Currencies are not just money. They are so many things. I am not kidding when I tell you you can negotiate anything. I'm going to touch on contracts at the end of this. You can negotiate deadlines. You can negotiate exclusivity. You can negotiate intellectual property rights. You can negotiate a number of social shares. This is all unrelated to money. And so you have to think about what are my currencies? What do I hold? What am I amazing at that I can offer that will enable me to get what I want and to give the other party what they want? And so don't just be focused on the money. Payment terms, getting paid in 30 days versus 60 days or 90 days, that's a negotiable term. People never think to ask, but I get it changed all the time. And then map the parties. So you need to know who you're talking to. There's lots of different people that you may talk to. There are gatekeepers that you can talk to and there are decision makers. And you need to know which person that you're talking to. So figure that out, know who you're talking to. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about research and what you have to do there. And then list your interests. Why, let's talk sponsored content. Why do I want to work with this brand? What would be good for me to work with this brand? What are my interests in doing so? And then what are their interests in me? Because I hear a lot of David and Goliath stories when I talk to clients, like, oh, that's so-and-so, insert, I'm gonna use Nike because, you know, that's Nike, why would they want to work with me? Well, they've already approached you, so clearly they've seen something in you and there's something special for you. 
So it's incredibly important to know what you're awesome at, what they're awesome at, and why would it work. And then the last thing you want to think about is what information am I going to give up? And what information am I going to get? And what information am I never going to tell somebody? Um, and so we're going to set the climate. So when we do that, we're going to set an agenda. And you're going to sit down, and you're going to say, this is what my conversation is going to be. So if I'm talking to a gatekeeper, and by gatekeeper I mean somebody who is guarding the gates to the decision maker, because you may get an assistant, somebody's assistant, in your first phone call, and you're going to get on the phone. No more of these emails. I don't care if you hate the phone. You make your money on the phone. There is a reason that I do consults with almost every single person that walks in the door. When I don't do consults, people don't work with me. But when they get on the phone with me, they almost always do. So I am telling you, you have to get on the phone. And I'm going to give you an example of how that works. So many years ago, right when I was starting my legal practice, I was working for a blogging company that ran conferences for bloggers. Some of you may know me from that time. And I ran their operations and I did all of their legal, but occasionally I would hop on a sales call with like a really high level potential sponsor. And so there was a potential sponsor, YouTube, that was going, was interested in sponsoring. And so they were like, we need you on the call. I was like, cool, I'd love to, that'd be great. So we get on the call with YouTube and this was a really big deal. YouTube was just, this was many years ago, they were just stepping into like the influencer space and this was gonna be kind of a test drive for them. And so I was like, cool, I could talk to, talk to YouTube. So we get on the phone and I'm looking out the window and I live in New York City. And I always joke that there are five days in New York City that are awesome and the other 360 days are awful and we all live there for those five days, right? Like that's all you want is those five days. This day was one of those days, right? So I'm looking out the window, I'm like, oh my God, it's gorgeous. And so I look outside and instead of saying anything, I just get on the phone and I'm like, isn't it beautiful today? And she goes, oh, where are you? And I was like, oh, I'm in the New York area. And she goes, oh, that's so funny. She's like, where, you know, where exactly? I'm like, well, I live in, you know, my office is in New York, but I, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey. And she goes, my sister just moved to Hoboken, New Jersey. I was like, what, what a small world, that's so funny. She goes, do you need a babysitter by any chance? And now I have two small children. They're insane. And I did need a babysitter because I always need a babysitter. And so I was like, uh, yes, I do. And please send her information over immediately. Does she mind boys that are animals? And she's like, no, she loves them. I said, we're sold. I was actually ready to hang up as if I was completely done with that conversation. That small, small conversation broke the ice. We didn't even have, we were just friends at that point. And we were done in 10 minutes and she signed on. And it was cause that never would have happened over email. I never would have gotten a babysitter over email. And we just clicked because sometimes when you have that touch, that conversation, it changes it in the world. This is why I come to live events. This is why I meet people. All it is is just meeting people, seeing what's up with them, seeing what's going on. So if you assume an agreement's gonna be reached, if you set the agenda, you know what you wanna talk about but you break the ice, and in a natural way, a conversational way, like that just was happened to be how I feel. And I get it, I like to talk. I know a lot of people do not like to talk, so practice. Practice that talk, practice here with people you've never met before, practice talking to people you don't know, and find the few conversation pieces that are natural for you to have that can break that ice. You need to make sure you find some kind of common ground. And I'll say this, sometimes you can't. There are people I am not able to break through. Now, I will spend a lot of time trying. I will. I will keep going. There was a mom in my one son's class who would not say hi to me. I spent the entire first half of the year, and we're friends now. So I will not quit. But you also have to have a lot of energy, and you have to be really positive and optimistic. So now, You've done your research. You know if you're talking to your gatekeeper. You know you're talking if you're a decision maker. You know what your interests are. You know what your ideal position is. You know what your walkaway position is. You know, you've talked to your friends. We all have got a posse. We've all got our crew. We talked about that, right? And so talk to your crew. Do you know this person? Have you worked with them? When I was negotiating with that really, the man who made me take the deep breath, I actually called a colleague and said, have you ever dealt with this attorney? And he's like, oh. He laughed a little and he goes, I have. So I did some research. I found out what his points were. So talk to your friends. And so um, that I think is really important too. So you've done your research, you know who you're talking to, you know what you're doing, you, 
you're ready to go. You're ready, you're set. Now we're gonna have the conversation. So how do you have the conversation? I like to start with something completely innocuous. I don't dive in. Now, there are some people, they don't want my nonsense. So I sense that quickly and I move on fast and I get right to it. Because there are some people, they're, they don't want the five minutes of chit chat. So you have to learn to be able to read that and once you get enough practice, you're able to. You should be asking all the questions. So my rule of thumb is you should be listening 70% of the time and talking 30% of the time. We like to talk, I like to talk about myself. I'll just say it, and a lot of people do. And so our instinct is to start selling really, really fast. Like, this is why I'm amazing, this is why I'm great. Well, you don't know what you're selling. So you need to find out why. You need to make sure that the research you've done, the interests that you've set forth, the options you've laid out actually match the reality. So start with asking open-ended questions. And so you wanna ask the whys, the hows, the tell me's, and then you're going to listen. And I don't mean listen the way I listen when maybe my kid's telling me a 15 minute long conversation, like story that he happened at school. I mean I am going to be solely focused on only listening. I'm not thinking about my follow-up questions. I'm not doing anything other than focusing on what the person is saying because you miss really good things. So the way that I achieve that and accomplish that is I take verbatim notes of what the person is saying. My brain, the way that my brain works is I just need to be typing the whole time because I'm focused on what they're saying. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to respond. I'm not thinking about what my position is. And you have to find your own method for that and that's called active listening. It means all you're doing is listening and you're just absorbing what they're saying. You can repeat their statements back to make sure you understood it. You can ask clarifying questions. So it's almost like a funnel, right? You start off, you start off big and you go down slow, so you go down small, like, so that you start getting the little bits of pieces of information. You wanna have your questions prepped in advance, but don't stick to it like a script. Go off, like have a conversation, like any interview. If you ever listen to a podcast when they do interviews, they've usually started off with one or two questions and then just sort of see where the conversation leads itself. That's how a good negotiation will go as well. And I want to talk about the power of the pause. Because pauses make people really uncomfortable. <laughs> and when people are uncomfortable, you know what they do? They talk. And so I got this amazing advice when I was like a very young lawyer, just fresh out of law school, going to do my first deposition. I was a litigator prior to the work that I did now, so I obviously have always loved to talk and argue. And so I went to my first deposition, and I was very green and very young and very scared, and everybody in the room was 25 years older than me at least, and it was quite uh, an interesting experience. But the partner came in my my, uh, my office and he could tell I was the color of this green dress over here and uh, he's like, you're gonna be fine. And I'm like, he goes, I wanna tell you something and I wanna remind you something. He goes, the stenographer never notes when you make a pause. And I was like, what? He goes, if you don't know what to say, just take a minute. Nobody remembers, like nobody's writing. And then she paused. <laughs> It's fine, so pause. And I will tell you that when you pause, I will almost guarantee, and I want all of you to try it, and then you can email me, the other person's gonna start talking again. And they're gonna say all the things they were too guarded to say because they're so nervous, because they're like, why did she pause? I was supposed to say something else, and I don't know what's going on, right? We've all had these thoughts. I always like when the other person pauses and I pause, and then we're on a pause, like standoff, and that gets awkward. <laughs> but um, mostly it doesn't happen. So pause, take your time formulate your questions, make sure you have the knowledge that you need. And at the end of the conversation, you've taken all the notes, I would just say, hey, can you just give me a minute to just take a look at my notes and make sure that all of my questions have been answered? And while I'm doing that, do you have any questions for me? And so that's a really good way for them to, because they're not thinking of questions that they want to answer you, so they're sort of scrambling and you're looking, and then you've gotten all your information. And so if you've noticed, we're now into step three, and we've not done any negotiating. We're just gathering information. And this sounds like an incredibly long and arduous process. It's not, it's not as long. It just needs to be laid out very clearly. Um, and so now you've done that. And they may ask you, you know, what's your dollar amount? What's this, what's that? And sometimes people wanna go down that route, 
But if you know what it is that you're looking for, and there are ways that you can push that off by saying, you know, I do have rates, but I need to know a lot of this other information so I can tell you what the appropriate rate for me would be, and this is what my rate is. And when you do end up ultimately saying your rate, you have to say it with authority, and that's incredibly important. So when you start answering questions and giving information, no questions, no, well, my rates are $2,000, but me, you know, sometimes I'll discount them. And, no, $2,000. That's okay. You're allowed to say that. So then you're going to actually get, and this may be in this conversation, this may be later. A lot of times people just gather information and then they're like, okay, I'm going to put together a proposal for you, right? Because we don't make proposals on our first conversations usually. And so you want to think about what your ideal position is and that's what you're going to be in your proposal. You don't know what this other party has, needs, or wants. And don't assume that you do. Now, if they flat out say to you, we have a budget of $300 and your rate is $5,000, you're probably not making a match and you're going to call it a day and move on. That's okay. But if you don't have that, if you're in a range, if we're in a space where there can be a negotiation, you're going to, you're going to know what your ideal position is and you're going to say it strongly and you're going to be okay with it and you're not going to question it. No one ever says no. You're allowed to ask for certain things. You're going to say why that's what you're doing. These are my interests. And it's not just because like I have a million followers and everybody loves me and all this stuff. There's lots of other reasons. This is when the statistics come into play. Real numbers, old previous case studies, things that you've done that you know about your site and your business and why you are worth this. You also want to acknowledge that you understand what the other side needs and is looking for. That's really important because we all want to be seen, right? And so I think what really puts a lot of people off in negotiations is when someone flies in, doesn't care what the other side is saying or is thinking or wanting, and just says whatever they need and that's the end of it. This is how it's collaborative. At the end of the day, there's probably going to be two or three issues, right? That's it. There's going to be a whole bunch of other issues that don't matter. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm, going to, I'm currently negotiating right now. We're at the end. Oh man, we're at the end. It's been a long process, and it is a trademark issue. So I have a client who filed for a trademark, and another party wanted to object to that application, and we are negotiating a settlement of that objection. And we are down to like, it is the worst of all lawyers. And we're like down to like sentences and periods and things. And so we were able to sort of, and I think, gosh, I did this, because they were nitpicking everything. I was like, I don't care about any of that. I don't need to win. I'm going to give you those wins, because they don't matter but I made it very clear I was giving those wins because they didn't matter because now they owe me something. And they realize that I've given up all this stuff and so now they've got to give me something. So the one thing I cared about, I got because they gave away a whole bunch of stuff they didn't know I didn't care about. But they didn't know that. They thought I, that was one of my interests. So we're going to discard any of those issues and we're going to focus solely on those. And now we are going to bargain. And so now we've done all of this work. It should be quick, it should be easy, it shouldn't be crazy. It may take time, there might be decision makers that they have to go get you know, more budget from, or I need to ask legal this, sorry, or this or that, but it, this is your give and take. And it's okay to give things. Give things that don't matter, or sometimes give things that do matter but aren't your deal breakers because you want to get the thing that's your deal breaker. But you're going to know what all of those things are, right? So your deal maker may be an exclusivity thing. A brand may approach you, let's just say they're breakfast cereal, and you have another client who doesn't do breakfast cereal but does something related to breakfast. So you know a deal breaker for you is you can't have an exclusivity clause in the breakfast world or in the food world. And so that's your deal breaker. But you may be able to give exclusivity in another way so that you've made sure that you're protected and that they feel like they're getting something from you. And remember what your currencies are. Remember what you're willing, what your ideal positions are, what you're willing to give, and when you're willing to walk away. And tell them, like the end result of that trademark issue was there was something we weren't willing to give away and it would have gone to litigation. And I just said, you're just gonna have to sue us over it. And they did not wanna sue us over it, but it was a risk. I mean, sometimes you sort of have to like, please don't sue us, <laughs> that would suck. Um, so yeah, so always bearing those things in mind. Like I said, we're gonna start high. I see all of you, we're gonna start high. You're not gonna be afraid to say no. 
Saying no is great, it gives you power. Don't do it for no reason, but have a good reason for saying no. And accept any, any concession they give you, just take it. Don't give another concession away. If someone's like, I'm fine with that, just take it. And then, please, please, please have a contract. Every single deal that you do, this is my lawyer now hat coming on, every single deal that you do where something is exchanged of value should have a contract. And I don't mean an email that has like two lines on it. I mean a real actual contract. I hear a lot of objections here. Well, they're not gonna wanna sign a contract. You don't wanna work with someone who doesn't wanna sign a contract. They are going to be your worst client that you've ever had in your entire life. Because when somebody raises a flag that there's a contract, that's a problem. It means they don't wanna follow the rules and they're not gonna wanna stick within the scope of your engagement. So it's really important. So what are some of the things, here's a little bit of the legal that I'm gonna give that you should pay attention to in a sponsored, well, I'm gonna do sponsored content, but this could be any kind of relationship you may have with a brand. It could also be a client services agreement as well. So if you offer services or something, your deliverables should be incredibly spelled, clearly spelled out. None of these TBDs, because those TBDs, which we've all seen them, they don't mean anything, and so later, if they come to you with something you never talked about, your contract isn't protecting you from that. So make sure, as much as you can, there are certain instances where you, know, you wanna get the agreement signed and you know, but make sure you have an out. If the TBD turns to be something you don't wanna do, make sure you have the ability to cut off, terminate the contract so that you're safe. Don't start doing work until you've signed the contract. The number of people that come to me are like, well, they told me the contract was coming and they needed a really short deadline, then they should get you the contract really quickly. But don't start doing the work because then you're gonna be out work if something, hap out work if something happens and you're not gonna get paid for that time. Things to think about. Payment terms. How do you get paid? Do you have to send an invoice? Do you um, have to go through their like invoicing system? Is it net 30, net 60, net 90 upon execution? Are you getting a deposit? When do you get the deposit? All of that should be clearly laid out. Um, timelines should be clear, laid out. How long do you have? Um, what kinds of materials are gonna be provided for you? Intellectual property, who owns the content that you're creating? What are they allowed to do with it? If you own the content, how are they allowed to use it? A lot of people don't realize it, but if you read intellectual property provisions, which I do every day as a hobby, you will see something called derivative works. A derivative work means that somebody can take a content that you've created and turn it into something else. Harry Potter books, Harry Potter movies are a derivative work of the Harry Potter books. So if you see that word in there, it means that they could take that and turn your beautiful image that you posted on Instagram into a billboard in Times Square. And so know what you have and know what you're giving away and make sure, if you're okay with that, that you're paid for it because you should be paid more for the ability to make derivative works. Exclusivity is another thing. Make sure that your exclusivity provisions are very clearly laid out. So make sure that they are specific. So I had a client, we'll use breakfast foods. So she had breakfast foods in her exclusivity provision. And like in my house, I eat pizza for breakfast sometimes. So like, is that breakfast? And so it was too vague, we narrowed it. So know how to narrow that. Know if you do have to sue someone, where do you sue them? If you live in New York and your client lives in California, you may have to bring suit against them in California. And so look at your jurisdictional clause. That's an important one. Um, you wanna look at your, we talked about payment terms, we talked about exclusivity. There's loads of other, I'm not gonna go too deep into contracts. If you guys have specific contract questions or any other questions, you're welcome to ask them. I think I'm almost getting close to being out of time. Um, so all I will say is this. Emails can be contracts, a lot of people ask that question, but they frequently don't have all of, oh, the other one I wanna talk about, confidentiality. This is a huge one. If you are entering into an agreement, know what your confidentiality obligations are. You may not be allowed to talk about the amount of money that you're being paid. So make sure you understand that, because I see people talking in blogger groups all the time, and I'm like, I read that contract, and they're not supposed to be saying that. So just be sure that you know what you're allowed to talk about. Um, and if you have questions, you know, start to try to learn how to read the agreements. It's important as business owners, we should all know at least baseline how to read it. Because um, it'd be great if you could read your own and then if something funky happens, then you just, you know, ask an attorney to help you out. So here are my top 10 tips. 
Um, and I've, we've listed a bunch out. We, I did, gave you guys like a negotiation worksheet in there. Don't be afraid to ask for what you want. Make sure you're always engaging in active listening, meaning we're really listening. We're not like doing six other things, like changing a load of laundry or trying to cook dinner or like reading an email while you're talking to someone. Make sure you do your homework and your research. Always be willing to walk away. Know your no position. Don't rush it. There's no reason to rush. If the other side's in a rush, that's on them. I, nothing annoys me more than when someone comes to me, they're like, I have the most urgent thing ever, and then it's radio silence for days. Like, I just had a client who was like, you must drop everything in the universe and get this done. I wrote them back, I'm like, well, I need this extra piece of information. Two weeks later, they got it for me. He's like, I need it done today. I was like, now you will wait. So don't be in a hurry. Get done what needs to get done. Take your time, feel comfortable. If you feel rushed, you're not gonna get the right deal. And that's okay, it is okay to say no. There is so much power in saying no. Anytime anyone approaches me with any kind of opportunity, my instant reaction is no. I need to be convinced why I should be able to do something, why I should take the time away from my business, my kids, my family, my, the gym, for, to add something else. So it's really important to lead with that and not think we're gonna say yes to everything. I don't say no out loud though, just like think it. Just be strong inside. Aim high, no more undercutting ourselves. Focus on the other side's needs. What are their pressures? Like why does Nike wanna work with me? Because I'm amazing, and because I'm talking to all the women in their 40s who have all the money and they wanna reach that demographic because those women listen to what I say. There is power in that, and that's what their interest is. Show them how their, sides, how their, other, how their needs are gonna be met. My, my, the people who read, they engage with me, they like. When I say I believe in something, they're gonna go buy it. And I see that, I truly see that. I see clients that post about something, and it is a run. I have a couple clients who have occasionally tagged me on Instagram, I'm not even kidding. I will get a rush of followers, I'm like, what, Every, this is unbelievable, you have true influence over the people that follow what, it, what you do and what you're saying. Don't give away anything without getting something in return and never take anything personally. There is no emotion in this at all. This is business. It is not personal. If someone gets personal, you tell them not to be personal. And that's what I said to that guy I, I started out talking with. I said, if you can't speak to me with respect, if you can't address me the way that I need to be addressed, our conversation is over and you can sue my client the end, and I'll let your client know why it went to this. And so now he calls me Ms. Lieberman. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know, here comes Steffi. Oh my gosh. This is the heaviest microphone pack ever. I just felt my dress like going backwards. <laughs> Hi, so Hi. Uh, um, I'm Lead Safe Mama, so I'm really controversial in what I do. I do lead poisoning prevention and I find lead in consumer goods. Um, so I have 10 lawyers. <laughs> um, and, Lucky uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, and so this funny thing just happened. Someone stole one of my images. And I'm just like, I don't need to deal with that. I don't have yeah. the time for that. My life is bigger than that. I just sure. let them, you know, it's, a, it's flattery. But then all my friends are saying, no, you need to go after them for that. Is, is someone like, I mean, I can't imagine you would take a little thing like that on sure. contingency. We're well, not on contingency. Yeah, like, and I don't know that it would be worth it because sure. I don't know anything about this other sure. blogger. She's really yeah. small, So uh, the piece of advice I have is your intellectual property is only as strong as you're willing to protect it. Um, and so sometimes it's not just about the dollars and cents, but sometimes it's about saying, I'm going to protect my intellectual property so that others know. Um, and it doesn't necessarily even need a lawyer. Sometimes it's you just reaching out saying, you violated my copyright and I need you to go ahead and take this down and never do that again because if you do, then I will get a lawyer. Yeah. It's as simple as that. But if you let people infringe your intellectual property, you lose rights in your intellectual property. I wanted to know your opinion about business insurance and errors and emissions insurance. I have insurance because yeah. I've had too many friends be sued, but I see so many bloggers without it and they're saying, I can't afford it. And so I just wanna know what your advice is as a lawyer. Um, if you get one of those terrible cease and desists because you accidentally posted someone's photo and you have the right insurance, your insurance will cover that. So that is worth it tenfold. I always think if you're in business and if you are 
treating yourself as a business that you just have to have business insurance. There are a lot of things people, you know, look, I get it. Like, it's hard to be. I'm a small business owner. I understand. There are just some things you just have to, they have to be a light on on your budget. You just have to invest in them. Um, I definitely see people who hire and pay for like $10,000 for coaches in a given year, but yet they're like, no, I can't hire a lawyer. And I'm like, well, you, you have to prioritize. And so ultimately, I think this, the peace of mind of having business insurance, I've seen many clients use it. If you're creating content, um, particularly if you're selling courses or membership or you know, you're worried about an, with intellectual property, I think it can be very valuable. I do recommend it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>